1988 season started under a cloudy sky as Georgia Southern kicked it to Newberry. It was returned 19 yards. That's as far as Wildman Carter would let Larico Moultrie go. Newberry's first play was nothing to write home about. Huddy clink scales went clank against a solid eagle wall. And doubts about Southern's defense and pursuit began to evaporate in the heat as Daryl Hendricks and Michael Berry met Mr. Clink Scales at the line of scrimmage two plays later. Unable to move the ball the second time they had it either and punting from their own one, single safety Taz Dixon gave the Eagles great field position, finding a crease to his right and scooting 17 yards to the Newberry 37. Then following some great blocking off the left side of the GSC line, Gary Miller got eight. And on second and two from the Indian 29, Raymond Gross pitched to the other Miller, Carl, who gave us our first thrill of 88, a 19-yard trek, first and goal at the nine. Raymond Gross, coming to his left, almost put it in, but was stopped just inside the five. We got no closer, so Mike Dowis came on to put a 20-yard chip shot through the uprights, and Southern was ahead to stay. And Mike was feeling much better, too made a lot of difference on the rest of the kicks you know getting the first one in, and then getting the first win for the team uh, just it takes a lot of pressure off of it, especially since we were on a losing streak of, yeah. of one game losing streak that we broke <laughs> how'd you feel did you feel comfortable out there yeah after that first one you know yeah I got a little butterflies first time in a couple of years I've been in a game but uh, after I got the first one away it was no problem with any of the rest just felt as just natural as could be. Southern's first touchdown of the campaign was set up on another piece of defensive brilliance. Freshman Mark Giles blocked Garland Greenway's punt, and the Eagles were in business at the enemy 26. That's not exactly a new experience for us, but it doesn't happen often. And I'd like to commend Coach Jim Gerard and, uh, <laughs> and his group of people that he calls DDTs. That's death, destruction, and terminators. Uh, they've worked awfully hard on, on rushing punts and punt returns, and if they continue to, to work hard that way, I really believe that it's going to be very productive for us. After Frank Johnson got us to the one, Ernest Thompson did his Herschel Walker impression to get GSE's initial touchdown. And if there were any doubts as to who was going to win this one, Raymond Gross and company began to dispel those rumors in a hurry. As Raymond went airborne to Ernest inside the 20, Frank Johnson showed his old freshman form as he knifed his way to the one on the ensuing play. And O'Learn got the call again as he bulldozed home behind a surging eagle line, and David Cool's extra point made it 17 to nothing Southern, and Cool felt a little cooler as well. I was going out there, I was really, really nervous, and um, I just wanted to keep my form and just kick it as easy, easy as possible and kick it right down the middle and I did. I'm happy about that. <laughs> there seemed to be a, a good feeling out there today. 12,000 people show up on a Labor Day weekend. The students aren't even here yet. Yeah, that, I was really surprised that, yeah, the school didn't even session and we had a good crowd. I was happy. After Newberry missed a field goal, the Eagle Express shifted to warp factor five. Carl Miller picked up 16 yards to the Eagle 35 and then it happened. Another of those questions you find yourself asking later where did Erk get this guy? As Raymond pitched a freshman, Daryl Hopkins, who turned the left corner and was finally run down 60 yards later. On second and goal, Ernest Thompson hit pay dirt for the third time on the afternoon, and it was 24 to nothing. But the Eagles weren't through yet. On their next possession, operating from midfield, Gross went to pass, saw an opening, and was through it like Moody's Goose on the way to a 31-0 halftime cushion, leaving empty-handed tacklers in his wake. Yeah, we worked pretty nicely today. Uh, we, we still have some things to work on. So, you know, the exchange, we put too many balls on the ground today, and we just have to work on that and still work on the passing game to complement the running game. It's always eagle time in Statesboro, but it's also convention time now, too. We'll talk about that at halftime. Our guest at halftime is Becky Gaddis. She is with the Convention and Visitors Bureau for the uh, for, for Georgia, for actually for Statesboro. Is that right, Becky? That's right. Statesboro Convention and Visitors Bureau. And I, you know, I don't think a lot of people knew that Statesboro had a Visitors and Conventions Bureau. Well, we're the smallest one in the state, but we're also one of the most active with involvements at all, all at levels of state associations. Now, how long have you been active? How, what's, what's going on here? Well, Statesboro, of course, the growth at Georgia Southern has made, put us on the map, and Ertz Eagles are largely yeah. responsible for that. But 
we have a lot of things going up, new motels and, and just the, the changes in the community itself. We're really excited about something that we've started pushing, and that's a package weekend for $89.80. Somebody can, two people can come to Statesboro for two nights and have a welcoming reception, continental breakfast both Saturday and Sunday, and a hotel of their choice. They just call the Convention Visitors Bureau, get more information. Uh, and that has made a real difference. That's been real popular. The first one was the Friday night before the first game, and it was a success, and we're looking forward to continued growth and continued success. Um, the state has gotten us involved in some marketing things at a state level, which I'm really excited about, some cooperation between the CVBs. Now, what is, um, when somebody wants to come here for a, a convention, a lot of people would think, well, you know, what is, what would Statesboro offer for a convention? But there are a lot of uh, companies that, you know, they don't bring three or 4,000 people, they bring 40 or 50, and they, they can't afford to come to a place like maybe Savannah or Atlanta or something. Absolutely. In fact, we have targeted, our target market is the 100 to 200 max group, and we have, the average group is about 100. And we've got, we can do the low country bowl, we can do the quail suppers, the pond house. We've got excellent facilities, meeting facilities at about four or five different places, one of which is Southern Center for Continuing Education, but not exclusively. We have lots of meeting facilities for smaller groups, less than 300. And I would think uh, this, this could kind of go on all year long. I mean, they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, football wouldn't enter into it. Uh, you have basketball, baseball, or track, whatever. Oh, we do. We have a full calendar of events through the year, and it's not just during the academic year of Georgia Southern. This is full year here in Statesboro, and we're really excited about it. I'm new to Statesboro, and I chose it because it had so much going on and so much. It's like a mushroom. It's just growing. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, there's, a, there's a good partnership between the college and, and, the, and the city. I mean, it, it just one helps the other. Oh, they do, and they both work hand in hand, and that is, that's exactly what we work with and we've been real pleased with the cooperation we've gotten at the convention visitors bureau uh, throughout the different organizations within the city and different civic clubs everybody's been real supportive of our efforts and we appreciate that because it takes teamwork okay so do you want to invite the folks uh, to statesboro absolutely come on down if we can't show you how sincerely southern we are there's nobody who can <laughs> okay becky gaddis our guest at halftime with the statesboro visitors and convention bureau we'll be back with the second half highlights of the newberry game right after this On third and eight, early in the third period, the Eagles began their next scoring drive as Raymond Gross ran the quarterback draw to perfection, whether that was his original intention or not. Eagle Airlines then made four consecutive flights, the third of which went to Ross Warsham for 13 yards and out of bounds at the 35. Ernest Thompson was the target on the next play, and Raymond did one of the most difficult things in football made a great pass while scrambling and on a dead run throws across his body Thompson an equally great catch leaping and grabbing it at the 11 for a 19 yard gain but the drive bogged down from there and a 27 yard field goal was needed from David Cool. it was right on the mark and 34 to nothing Eagles kick is good. 27 yard field goal by David Cool. Then for the first and only time in the game, Newberry answered as quarterback Pat White rolled to his left for nine yards to the Indian 46. Two plays later, freshman running back Dwight Cummings went charging to the happy hunting ground 49 yards away. 34 to seven Eagles, but no one dressed in Eagle blue and white seemed particularly concerned. Uh, at times our offense looked great. At times our defense looked great. Uh, defense played awfully well. They ran straight at us and gashed us for seven and eight several times, and then for a 49-yard touchdown run, which kind of made everybody unhappy, especially Coach Healy and me and, and, and the team, too. I hope it did make them angry. Uh, hopefully that won't happen again. But it was a great day for Georgia Southern. As you say, a, a lot of things happened. We got to see a lot of new faces out there. Uh, I thought our guys gave us a good effort. And usually when you get the good effort, good things are going to happen for you. And it wasn't long before good things started happening again with a new helmsman as Ken Burnett came in to get those seven points back. A 14-yard pass to Tony Belzer got things started. And then somewhat of a surprise, a pitch to Belzer, who skirted the heavy traffic along the right corner for 15 yards. And then the officials added 15 more for a personal foul as Belzer got hit out of bounds. 
on the next play. Burnett went right back on top. Belzer the target again. Tony ran right under a beautiful pass for six more points. It was 41 to seven in favor of the good guys. And the Southern defense continued to shine yesterday as well. Just ask James Wildman Carter, who was his usual outspoken self, and brought his cousin along as a bodyguard during the interview. We worked together real good. I, I thought we did today. We, you know, we had a little weak points in the defense, but we're going to work it out and just keep trying to get better every day. You know, work on it week by week, one game by a time. <laughs> good test for you because of the the heat and everything today. Yes, we. I, I was glad the sun came out. I want. I, I hated the rain. I said, oh, "Come on, heat. Come on." Because we need to get some heat. That's that's our key. You know. As the third quarter was ticking away, defensive tackle Darren Alford's heads-up play gave the senior the thrill of his football career. Not that the rest of us didn't enjoy it, too. Grabbing a fumble out of midair and was long gone on a 45-yard touchdown run. I hadn't practiced in about a week due to an injury in my leg, but it held up pretty good today. Uh, I didn't think I was going to get to run that fast, but I made the touchdown. Uh, Giff Smith, he, uh, he had a blitz on. He hit him from the backside. The ball popped up in the air. <laughs> and there it was. I grabbed it and ran for the goal line. <laughs> That has to make that. That's got to be the thrill uh, of a career for a lineman. It is. It sure is. I, he's, I was grinning <laughs> ear to ear when I thought made that. You've been signing autographs and stuff. Ah, uh, few. <laughs> Midway through the fourth stanza, the final points of the afternoon came on another Burnett to Belzer hookup. Only this time with another Belzer, Tony's younger brother Daryl, who made a nifty run to glory and a 55 to seven advantage, and so it stayed. The defense did the rest, and Taz Dixon was pleased. I think everybody responded well. I think all the players, first of all, I think the defensive personnel likes the defense. And in that way, you know, everybody will play better, I feel like. And uh, they think everybody responded well today. Everybody likes the defense. How about the punt return? Did you feel, you feel good about that? Oh, uh, yeah, I was, I was more relaxed than I thought I was going to be. I thought, I, you know, I feel like I'd probably be a little more jittery back there than I was, but I felt, I felt pretty good right there. We even got the opinion of some self-appointed experts. I thought it was, it was okay, but I think they could have played a little bit better. Think so? Yeah, they could have <laughs> Think play it's going to be a good season? Yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be a real I good season. I think they're going to go all the way this year. I think they're going to go all the way this year. Well, it'd be nice to beat Florida A&M first. The Rattlers are on the horizon, and Urkel have final comments in a moment. Well, the first game is history, the Newberry game uh, against Georgia Southern, and it looked like, um, Irk, we had a little bit of everything today, from, from the weather to, um, to the defense scoring, the offense scoring a lot, and uh, the defense also doing a good job of keeping Newberry out of the end zone most of the time. Well, first of all, we broke a losing streak. Yeah. You know, we went into this game with a one-game losing streak against Appalachian, and we won the game, and that's the most important thing that happened today. It, defensively, um, there were a lot of people there although we saw new faces there was still some experience out there well we've got some people like taz dixon and terry young who played an awful lot um the people who played some up front never really have played a great deal except wilbur carter but uh, for the most part i was pleased with their performance i think the jury is still out as to whether uh, as to what is going to happen to us if people line up strong people and run straight at us uh, in a way i'd like to find the answer to that question and then in another way i really don't want to know but um, our guys played good today and then uh something that rarely happens you see it every now and then uh, on a blitz uh, the ball popped out of the quarterback's hands or the tailbacks whatever um, darren alford picked it out of the air and he looked, he looked just like he knew what he was doing. He caught the ball, ran for a touchdown. That's what, you, that's what you're supposed to do. I think we found out a lot about our football team. And certainly enough things happened out there on the field today for us to have something to go on. I do know that one of the most inconsistent areas of our whole game today was our kickoff coverage. And we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Maybe we don't have the right people in there. Maybe we're not covering in the proper lanes. But we're going to find out, and hopefully we'll correct that before we lose a game that way. Coming up, uh, Florida A&M, what do we know about them? Well, they beat us last year. Our guys are, even after the game today in, in the dressing room, reminded me that next week is payback week. Now, it's good for them to feel that way. 
Uh, the most important thing is for them to practice that way and then prove it next week. 19 of 22 starters return. Florida A&M is on the upswing. Uh, they're pre predicted uh, preseason to win the MEAC, uh, their conference. They're playing Delaware State today. Our super scout, Pat Spurgeon, is there to see them play, and we're waiting for a good scout report tomorrow. Okay. Well, we'll see you down there in Jacksonville next Saturday night. How you like the, doing this sitting down? <laughs> this, this, this feels fine. I love the work that they've done here. They've done a lot of work on this patio out by the Luftonville. It's a beautiful place and a beautiful setting. Uh, I just can't think as well sitting down and standing up. <laughs> I agree. I think we'll do it standing up from now on. But we'll see you next week, Eric. <laughs> That's the Eric Russell Show for this week. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Bill Edwards. For everybody associated with the show, thanks very much. And we'll see you with the highlights of the FAMU game from Jacksonville next Sunday night. Good night.